Good morning, everyone. So happy you are here, and this room is almost full. Today we have, as VP of membership, um, I'm I do the SLA, Sports Leadership Academy, um, meetings. Um, and I'm here to introduce to you Debbie Stewart. She's been doing this for some time. She's very good at this. So welcome, Debbie. No pressure. Good morning, everyone. As Jean just said, my name is Debbie Stewart. For those of you who do not know me, um, I would like to welcome you to our Far West Ski Association Snow Sports Leadership Academy program. Um, I come to you with a little bit of travel background, which includes working with the Convention of Visitors Bureau in Visalia. Um, I did sales and marketing there. And I worked as a sales manager at the Sac Sacramento Hilton Hotel, which led me to a position as commission coordinator, public re relations director, banquet manager, and a little bit of this and that, and as we all do with volunteering for Far West. So I'm delighted you're here. I hope you will enjoy our interesting little program here. And my goal today is to share information with you as well as engage with you in the audience and um, get some feedback and have a little conversation with you as well. So welcome, very, uh, welcome and thank you very much for coming. with PowerPoint, so, so bear with me, you guys. <laughs> so today's uh, seminar is Group Travel Secrets, Details Determine Destiny. to many people. Is it kismet? Is it fate? Is it happenstance? Is it doom? Uh, it could be many things to you. As we are on our path to destiny, we travel professionals, like many of you in this room, have gone through quite an experience in the recent years. We've been through hard times, we've been through craziness, um, only to prevail, only stronger. While living through the pandemic, we've all had struggles by recharging our mindset, expanding our Far West International Travel Program, and focusing on many things, including the positive aspects that we want to remember as we are all volunteers for our organizations. So today, I would like to, to all think about not just what we've been through, but where we're going with our programs. Travel, travel, crazy. Um, we've been in a pent up demand for travel, haven't we? guys have all experienced that. In most cases, waiting is a drag. <laughs> waiting for the future travel trip. Joan's back there going, yes. <laughs> um, waiting can provide a positive aspect. 
it can create a sense of anticipation. It can give you opportunities to talk about the future. What can we look forward to? And in some cases, it teases you. It teases your surprise element. Um, expectations are a good thing. And so we as travel leaders want to make sure that we're presenting a very <coughs> positive, a positive aspect to all this craziness that we've gone through. As trip leaders, we want to keep our participants engaged. We want to make sure that they know we are there for them, that we are constantly working on their behalf, and that when we finally get to our destiny, that it's going to be a great thing. So let's talk about air. <laughs> air is crazy these days. Um, we've been in a turmoil with air. Air is still in a turmoil with us. Um, there are situations that airlines are going through staffing shortages. So they don't have enough pilots trained. We're working with our travel companies and tour operators that are negotiating for us. And it's really important to stay connected with your good team, to stay connected with your good companies, and in many cases, continue to communicate with them daily. I mean, Sean with Holidays is working with us on our international trip next year to Madonna di Campiglio. And he and I are communicating every other day, at least once or twice a week. Um, that is just what you need to do. I, sometimes I say, it's Monday, which is my day off. And I say, you were expecting me to call? Yep. And um, sometimes it's hard for them to get that information on a timely basis as well. There are concerns about time, climate change. Is it having a, an effect on air transportation? Is it having an effect on the quality of the air in terms of turbulence? You know, recently in the news, we've all heard aircrafts that have had unforeseen situations where they're uh, passengers get injured because they'll come into a flight pattern and the air has changed and the pilot has no warning for that. So it, it, they call this um, clear air turbulence. They have no time to prepare. So from our perspective, we need to make sure that we're conveying to our participants that Things can happen, things will happen. Be smart, continue to communicate with your people. Okay, let's talk about business models. They have changed completely. Many of you have been in the travel world for a long time. You've been participants, you've been leaders. Because we're dealing with the pent up demand for travel, people have felt deprived. Demand is at a all time high now. And what is, as they liken it to, is like um, the gold rush, Black Friday sales. It's like way, way crazy. What we as leaders need to recognize is we want to make sure that we are crossing our T's and dotting our I's every step of the way. In terms of hotels and resorts, they are now using something that's called the revenue managers. And they're no longer using a static 
pricing structure, meaning you post a price and that is your price forever. When we negotiate our contracts with our travel companies and tour operators, then you are dealing with your pricing. However, the industry has changed so much that they're using dynamic pricing structure. The airlines have been doing that for years. So what I mean by that is the airlines will sell so many seats at this price. And when those seats are full, that price goes up. And when that category is full, that price goes up. So what we experience as planners is we may have someone of our group say, well, I could go online and I can get this price at today, I can get it at that price. And that airline may be only selling or marketing one seat. And so what that does is it puts us in kind of a precarious position because they don't recognize that. And so what, again, is important is to continually communicate with these people to let them know this is how we are negotiating for you. Any questions about that? Because it's totally different and it's, it's how things are going. Aphrodite is shaking her head, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and if you're not familiar with the fact that these things are changing on us and we're not gonna change it back, we need to be smart. Luckily enough, when since I handle the international travel program, luckily enough, lift tickets in Europe are considerably cheaper than in the United States, on a day-by-day -day basis especially. Yeah, considerably. When we are selecting your destinations, when you are doing your research, um, try to be really cautious do your, do your homework. What I am encouraging my participants to do is to travel slowly. And what I mean by that is when you are traveling abroad and we are going to a ski destination or to a uh, adventure trip destination, try to see everything but more slowly. When we collect places, we're in the getting mode versus experiencing them in the being mode. That's when we create memories that last. I also want to encourage people to recognize that we're familiar with variety as a spice of life, but familiarity is the main course. So planning your successful trips. When you're looking for <coughs> adventuresome people, you want people that are like you, you want people that are um, fun and engaged, and you want to bring people in that are a good fit for your group. You want to have fun yourself. You want to continue to have a positive attitude that's going to convey to your participants and we all know those of you who've been traveling for many years Dave Felker and leading your groups Paul Markowitz um, things are going to happen things will happen things do happen but what can make or break the situation is how you're handling it I am very fortunate because we have grown our international travel team. And that currently in this room involves Lori Romina in the back, George Stewart, Armand Gutierrez, and two additional people. We all are working together to deal with any situation that takes place. And 
when you know that you, I have a backup, and I know my team is there, and if I have a situation that we need to have a mini meeting, we will gather. It may be in the middle of the night, doesn't matter, to deal with something that we end up with or something that we're currently working on. Um, build your team. Know your customers, know your participants, treat them like your family. So, fan trips. I'm going to be very clear about this. Do not go on a familiarization tour because you want a free trip, because you want a highly discounted trip as a trip leader. Bad juju. Not good. The vendor, the supplier, wants to see that you are serious, that you have a marketing plan for that destination. My, my tour companies are smiling. <laughs> um, that you're gonna sell it, that you're gonna market that location. That is why you are there. That is why they are enticing you at a discounted price. And back in the day, things were comped. Nowadays, you may have to pay a little out of pocket, but significantly discounted. Be realistic. Don't take advantage of them. That hurts the reputation of all of us travel leaders. We are there for a purpose. You have a commitment to that company. And there's no better way to educate yourself on those destinations until you experience it. So I will tell you, when I'm forecasting and looking at future trip destinations, if I haven't physically been there, I can't sell it properly, I can't market it properly, I can't educate our people properly. So we do organize a time for me to do a look-see. But my, my request for you is be respectful. That's the proper thing to do. So, because I do focus on international travel, it's very interesting that where we go may not be exactly like how you live in the United States. For example, I have heard stories of people saying, well, I went to Spain and I couldn't understand because they were all speaking Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Hello! <laughs> but those things do happen. <laughs> Instead of brushing around like tourists, try to blend in with the local culture. Listen, learn, experience the world like a true traveler. On our Far West documents, on our registration documents, we do have a disclaimer that says, I am aware that the culture of the place or places I am visiting may not be exactly what I'm normally accustomed to in the United States. 10 years ago, we didn't have that in there. I experienced that, took it to our travel executive committee we decided this disclaimer is important. We need to put that on there. And I would really encourage all of you to do the same. Brief your travelers on how to best represent America while traveling abroad. Being culturally sensitive, avoiding contentious political discussions, and honoring the, tra the traditions of the host country that you are visiting. That shows people how respectful you are of their country. Because after all, we're leaving our country, we're going to their country. 
You cannot always expect them to be fully fluent in English. We're in their country. So, on our, as, as I was saying on our documents, um, and you, each state and each club or council may need to have your documents reviewed periodically by legal counsel. We have waivers. I am required, as in my position, I'm required to maintain the liability waivers for our Far West participants. When looking at local activities, there may be things that are not part of our trip program, but we like to say, while you're in the area, you may choose to do this, that, just sledding or something that we're not organized for, but you want to make sure that you have a nice brief disclaimer that says, for informational purposes only so that it does not come back to your club council or your directors and officers by endorsing an event or activity that is not organized through you. Something else that you would want to be aware of is that on your registration documents, your type font cannot be smaller than six points. <laughs> now we can't even see six points <laughs> on our documents, but by law, <laughs> that is a legal thing. So be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, communication. I can't stress that enough. If anything, I probably am prone to over talk things. But you want to make sure that your guidebook has all the pertinent information that your people will need. Where to find information if you don't have that listed. Be sure that you have that. Your guidebook. Typically, I like to have a printed guidebook that we hand out or actually send to our people in advance. Some organizations, some councils email their guidebook information, as we are all working with our mobile devices. Oftentimes, that is the method to use. So there are many ways to continue to communicate your, with your people during and prior to and during and after your trips. <coughs> Internationally, in, it's important to let people know how to and what about foreign currency. Some people may have never traveled abroad. They don't know how this works. So we try to give them a little uh, advanced help knowing how to and what to do in advance prior to departing. And I know the um, travel companies that promote and market abroad, that is in all their <coughs> documentation. I also encourage people to let their banks know that they are leaving. Contact your credit card company. Some of the some of the companies now don't require that. Yet it's always good to be on the proactive side there. I also recommend that people bring more than one credit card of two different accounts in case one becomes frauded as I experienced in our last trip, you have a backup. Okay, does that make sense? <clears throat> By the way, speaking of communication, before you leave, I prepared a trifle for all of you. And my team over here, including Beth, who's a great volunteer whenever she's around, um, <laughs> this will be available for you. So some of the information, especially links and website data when we get further along in the program will be in here so you don't need to write it down believe it or not it will be on the far west website <laughs> you bet yeah. yeah and my contact information is in here if anyone has any questions after the presentation 
That's what we are here for. Our jobs are to not only promote Far West travel programs, and I say R as in myself and Nancy as the North American VP of VP of North American Travel. That is our perspective. We are here to work with clubs and council travel leaders, trip directors. We also encourage travelers to make a list of your health information. And that includes any documents that you need, emergency contacts. Outside of the US, 911 is not going to work. So you need to know what that emergency number is abroad. We personally, Armand handles our guidebook for our international trips, and we have that always listed. Information on medication, allergies, health insurance, travel itinerary. Some people like to keep it on their phone, and it's been encouraged to have a printout. So, you know, communicate. All right. Trip insurance. How many times can we say it is highly recommended? It is highly recommended. Far West does not sell trip insurance. We are not in the insurance business. However, on our upcoming trip, we do work with our tour operators. Sean with Holiday Ski Tours does offer trip insurance. So what we say to our members in writing and verbally, we highly recommend trip insurance. You are free to choose any company of your choice, your selection. If you would like to consider what our tour operator offers, here's the information. But it's really, really important these days. And what I am reading, and those of you in the industry, feel free to chime in on this. What I'm reading is you want to make sure that you have really good uh, evacuation off the ski mountain coverage. Um, there is cancel for any reason insurance. I am hearing that if there are trip interruption situations, which can be multiple ways. Sometimes your traditional trip insurance may or may not cover that, but the cancel for any reason gives you higher coverage. I'm not gonna ask for uh, details on that, but what I am gonna ask for you to do is do your research. And as a trip leader, tell your people to read the fine print because each company has all their little details that may be different than what we've used last time. Do your comparison. Timing for insurance can vary greatly. Some companies are, you have a week or two weeks after your first payment. There are some companies that you can buy up to the day before you leave. Um, basically, once again, communicate this to your people. We don't sell insurance, but you do want to do your research and get that information. And especially traveling abroad, it is really, really helpful <coughs> to have that, have that participant have their insurance. In many ways, we will help them recoup and recover whatever we can on their behalf. Most of the time when a claim is filed after the trip, I'll receive some version of communication from the insurance company saying, you know, can you provide this? What is, what is your cancellation policy, blah, blah, blah. And I just email them our regular documentation that has everything written. So again, my feeling is I'm the mama bear and those are all my babies. And I'm there to take care of them. Liability insurance is a little bit different. There are 
insurance programs that are available and encouraged to use for each club of Far West. Now, that is in here, and I want you guys to most definitely take this back to your club and make sure that you have some version of club council liability insurance. There is also a directors and officers component that are two separate policies. So once again, when we put ourselves in a position as volunteers as we do, you're also putting yourself in a position of liability. You can possibly be liable for things. Protect yourself. Again, as a officer of your club, you are now equipped. If you don't have this, they don't have this, feel free to take that back to your board of directors. Something that's kind of interesting is carpooling. Carpooling is not recommended, <laughs> and a lot of clubs do this. Um, it's not easily insured. Who's the driver? What kind of insurance do they have? How good of a driver are they? Um, be really, really careful about that. That is something that I know is done, but again, keep in mind that puts you in a reliable situation. To develop waivers for your trips that if it involves any version of insurance, have it reviewed by legal counsel. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about seller travel rules. California, Hawaii, and Washington State are required to have seller of travel commitments, seller of travel with um, registration. In California, they have what's called TCRC, Travel Restitution, Travel, Um, restitution trust? Restitution fund. fund. It's either yeah, counselor fund. Okay. So, I'm not familiar with what the requirements are in Hawaii and in, in Washington, but the California, as we call CST, does not apply to anyone who does not reside in California. So if there's a situation that someone is filing a claim because of one thing or another, or they felt that something was not handled properly or whatever, there are ways for them to file a claim. You wanna make sure that you have all your ducks in a row, that you have all your, it, it, at any point if you are selling travel, you are marketing, you're emailing your friends and you're selling a trip, you're selling travel. That involves air or sea transportation. Have I missed anything, Gloria? Okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's really important and you need to be careful. You really need to be very, very careful about that. Um, you know, we want you to come back here. We don't want to come visit you behind bars. <laughs> okay, safety and security. We know that the COVID scenarios and rules and regulations have lessened. Things have become <clears throat> calmed down in many cases. They could ramp up again for all we know. This information is in your trifle. Don't worry about writing it down. But health and safety abroad is really critical, very important. Uh, you still want to be monitoring the World Health Organization, the 
Center for Disease Control, CDC, I always send out multiple times and included in our guidebook the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. And if you don't know what that is, you as trip leaders need to know. It's free. It provide, it's, a, it's a registration with the U.S. government that will provide your participants advisory if there's a riot that is going to or taking place in your destination, you will be advised. And I can testify it works. Because I had our group in India and there was a demonstration that was scheduled to take place at this particular area that we were going to be transferring through by bus. And I got my notification early, early, early in the morning. And when we got on the bus, our guide got a phone call and said, we're going to be diverting our route because there's going to be a demonstration <laughs> taking place where we're going. And I knew that in advance. So again, go online. It's free. I encourage all your participants and people that travel on their own. They travel abroad. Give them this information. On all of our scuba dive trips, we require that they have the Divers Alert Network Insurance called DAN. <coughs> and it's not negotiable. They are required to provide their information in the registration and have it verified. So again, it's a big responsibility on what we do. No. We're hearing a lot of information about sustainable travel. Travel behaviors are changing. In a travel report in 2020, it stated 53% of millennials are choosing eco-friendly options compared to 55% of those 55 years and older. We all know uh, the demographics of our group, but our hopes is that we are going to generate some younger generations to join us as well. It also states that even 20% of the older travelers are still our bread and butter clientele. So overall, 42% of consumers are making travel decisions based on environmental considerations. Interesting, huh? We really hadn't talked about sustainable travel. And we're looking at group travel, and we're planning things, but we need to be broadening our thought process as well, especially if we're wanting to generate new and younger clientele, new participants. 74% of the respondents say they want an authentic experience that are represented by local cultures. They want to find tours that will give back to the community. And many of you may be organizing things like that. Um, examples of that are food <coughs> programs. When you're traveling to an area, going to a school, a local school, helping with a lunch program. Um, if you haven't done that with your groups, I highly recommend that you do. It is a moving experience and something that you will never forget. Have you guys heard of the term green washing or green sheening? Okay. It is defined as a form of advertising or marketing spin in which green PR is marketed deceptively. Um, it persuades the public that they are selling eco-friendly sustainability, but there's a large contingency out there 
that is greenwashing. It's, they're not telling you the truth. So once again, when you are doing your research, really look into authenticating this and confirming this because it, it will mislead you. It will mislead your members. It talks about environmental imagery that may not be the truth. And not only do we want to be authentic in what we are offering and selling to our participants, but as a unity, as travel, travel leaders ourselves, we want to be authentic in what we are saying and what we are doing. Um, so the question is, is net zero really emissions zero? You hear about net zero with the carbon and you hear about the aircrafts and things. So look into that. Look into that. So you're missing my little AI girls, but that is all over the media. It's all over the news, it's all over the internet. Airlines have been using AI for years. Uh, many companies have been using AI, artificial intelligence, for years. We just didn't know they were doing that to us. And in many cases, you hear chat GPT, you hear open AI. Um, the TSA is looking at using facial recognition in many of their destinations that will allow people to go through TSA without providing the passports. So they're looking into things like that. Um, there's more to come in that area. I'm not an AI expert, I don't claim to be, but I just want to kind of pique your curiosity to look into um, what's going on. The other thing that you may not know is a term called juice jacking. Have you guys heard of that? Juice jacking. So we all go to the airport, we all have our mobile phones, and we're wanting to charge it. So we use our USB plug and we plug into their USB port. Don't do that. That gives has given many people at airports primarily, they go in and they reconfigure that port. You plug your device in and they're pulling out your data. That's called juice jacking. So they're recommending that you use a plug and then plug your USB cable into the plug, into actual socket. So if that's not one piece of information you've learned from me today, share that with your people because it could destroy their phone. It could just, it could take all the data off of it. You get over to Europe and they're stuck. So, Does that yes. happen if you have a VPN? No. Well, no, VPN is phone. your internet connection, your virtual personal <laughs> network. But this is more of a charging application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're like they do the credit card readers are doing it with the charging. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But yeah, but since you brought up VPN, that's a good thing to comment. Um, it is also sensitive to be using open Wi-Fi. And when we're negotiating contracts, we're looking for hotels that provide Wi-Fi for our members. Free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi. Well, there is a controversy on how good or not so great that is because you are vulnerable you are vulnerable uh, what he was saying vpn is your virtual virtual private network which provides you your own internet access and you're not going through a public wi-fi well, it, it secures the private it it secures the it. private yeah. okay it's so it's encrypted I use ExpressVPN, and it's supposed to be the fastest of all the VPN providers, and it also doesn't use very much energy. I, it's, it's a great, and it's pretty inexpensive. 
And that is an annual fee? Yeah, I think it's like thirty dollars is what I paid. But yeah, it's it, it's I know there are several free. several companies out there. I just personally have not used one. The free ones are super slow. I would not okay. do the free ones. Okay. Alrighty. Well I'm caught up here with you guys. Okay, so um, COVID restrictions are changing. They are reducing worldwide. Currently, Chile just released all their restrictions. When I was creating our presentation here, at that point in time, which was a couple weeks ago, there were only 25 countries that are still requiring testing. And the World Health Organization has dropped the COVID emergency rating. Now, just to say that may not change, once again, do your homework. Make sure that you are providing the most up-to-date information, especially prior to departure, because <coughs> things change. I mean, when we were dealing with our trip uh, two and three years ago, things were changing nearly daily, you know. So um, do your research. That is our responsibility. We are the mama bears. The TSA is making many changes. And I think this is really important, especially for those of you who have families on your trips. And just share this with your, your membership anyways when they are traveling. It used to be that the children could piggyback on their parents as long as they're in the same manifest, their TSA pre-check category. And it was up to 12 years old until recently. The TSA just changed that, and now it goes all the way up to 17, including 17 years of age. And that, yes, that should help in the process. Um, there are many options out there. The TSA also recently deployed a new credentials authentication, authentication technology, CAT scanners, to allow agents to screen travelers without scanning or looking at their boarding passes. So, but you can't use it as an application. <laughs> right, right. One should know that if they are a recipient of the new pacemaker. <laughs> um, right now, flyers at selected airports include some, some in Arizona, Maryland, Colorado, Georgia. They can now upload their ID to the Apple wallet, which is now being used through TSA. Okay. And they anticipate more airports going into that wallet ID capabilities. And they're anticipating Connecticut, Hawaii, Iowa, Kentucky, Mississippi, Ohio, Oklahoma, Puerto Rico, and Utah. I did not say California, Oregon, Washington, <laughs> where most of us are from. But yeah, but things are changing and again, when you're dealing with groups, and we had 104 people in Europe last trip, uh, that's a process, you know, to get everyone through. Okay, so I'm going to change avenues here slightly, and I'm going to share some information that has not been shared with you before from me. In order for us as good travel management trip leaders, we need to develop a good team. You don't necessarily have to do it all yourself. You want to recruit your successor. You want to prepare for the unexpected. What happens to your organization if something happens to you or your computer and you're the only person that has that information on your system. Protect your company as well as yourself. 
find someone who is trustworthy within your team, within your board, to make sure that they have all the information that one would need if something were to happen to you. Passwords, bank accounts, <coughs> you know, critical information. And we may not have thought about that in its entirety, but as you're developing your team, um, share your data. I am very, very strongly opinionated about this. I don't want to keep it close to my chest. I don't need to keep it close to my chest. We're a team, we're a family. And if something were to happen to me, I would never, ever, ever want to put my team in a crappy position because Debbie Stewart's the only one that has this information. Silly. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Maintain your backups. Use your hard drives. Use Dropbox. Use the cloud. Website storage any and all good sources that many people have access to, being the trustworthy individuals. For example, uh, many of our international documents, contracts, bank accounts, financials, all of that is stored on my personal computer, hard drive, and in Dropbox. And those people that need access to that have that accessibility to it. So again, protect yourself. Have an emergency plan with the right plan in place. Have you guys, do you guys have that in your clubs? Yeah. We need to do that. We really need to do that. So, In terms of team development, mentorship. You're already going to look for a successor. Know your role. What is your role? We run trips, but it's, it's much broader than we take people to Europe. When we go to Aspen, Snowmass, Dale, Breckenridge, North Star, you know, we run trips. But our responsibility is huge, and you know that. You guys do it. It's more than what anyone besides sitting in this room would ever recognize. Provide really good direction to the people that you are teaching. Know your limits. Know the direction you're heading. Create an open path of sharing that information with them. Have a good subset of directions. Things that need to be done, make sure you have good instructions on that. Putting them in the right order. I mean, there are times where I think, oh, I need to write this down, I need to, but I gotta get this done. I need to write this down because this is the, but I need to get this out. You know, we need to balance that. You may need to mentor each member of your team individually. Help them find the exact path that they are going within your organization. Delegate, and you too will definitely improve your productivity. Communicate, prepare, share, unite, and be organized. And that will lead you to a very successful travel program as well. So this is Far West Ski Association Travel Vision Statement. We believe that travel should be easy, it should be fun. It should be worth your time and have exceptional value. It should energize and transform. And above all else, it should be on 
be beyond the ordinary. And I want to show you my last slide. I will get it up for you. There are a lot of new opportunities, new destinies in this big, beautiful world. These are places that I and our Far West Travel Team have been to, and they're memories of a lifetime. So I'd be happy to uh, take questions from the audience, comments, thoughts. I have a couple of comments on yes. that. Just a couple of other tips. One on travel insurance. Yes. Be very careful in looking at the ex sports exclusions because some policies do not cover you if you ski off piste, which is particularly um, relevant in Europe where there's a lot of inbounds but off piste. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some travel insurance will not cover you for that or if you do any racing as well. So, and some Correct. policies will. Correct. I've heard bad things about the Orbitz travel insurance too. Can you speak up? Please? Yeah, I've heard bad things about the travel insurance offered by Orbitz, that it's not worth the money you pay for it because they, you, it's very tough to actually get a, to get a claim mm -hmm. or to, but to have a claim, be compensated for a claim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sean, would you be able to address the Gentlemen's yeah, actually, about insurance. in Europe also there's a lot of uh, lift tickets you could purchase that actually you can buy insurance with your lift ticket. Right. Zermont, for example, yeah, just recent right. past year, there was an option to buy insurance that'll have you evacuated off the mountain that would be covered where your regular insurance would cover that. Another right. item too, as you pointed out, with cancel for any reason, that's not available in Washington State, for example. They don't recognize it. Uh -huh. And also we're cancel for any reason does come into play again. It has to be purchased within two weeks, typically, of your initial deposit on the trip. So, but yeah, the uh, insurances, uh, France, Switzerland, a lot of the different European companies, or countries, sorry, mm -hmm. are um, adding those optional insurance for the lift tickets as well. So Zermatt's on the and Icon Pass. Mm -hmm. uh, can you buy the insurance through Icon Pass? Then? Yes, you can buy insurance. So this is what we did, because we just had our 104 people in Zermatt. And pe people did bring their icon pass. Mm -hmm. And partnerships with the pass programs vary and change. So again, our responsibility is to learn what that is at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So we pre-sold lift tickets to our members if they did not have an icon pass. If they had an icon pass, then we, and they wanted to add insurance to their pass, we encouraged them to take it to the ticket window along with their passport or a proper identification, and they could add on insurance to their ICON pass. So each destination may have a different protocol that and in my case, I contacted Sean, since he was handling our trip for Far West, and said, what do I tell people? How do we do this? So we wanted to inform them in advance. Not all European countries or resorts have a partnership, but those that do, that we know at the time of departure, we will share that information with them. Having experienced some medical um, situations on our trip, I have made a, an executive decision that I would sell the lift ticket with insurance as we chose to sell Zermatt with the availability to ski over to Italy. Because you, you could have one or the other and we, we sold our lift tickets in advance, we just automatically put on Zermatt and Slovenia, the Italy side. In the case that someone got over there and couldn't get back, they did not get stuck with the tickets sold by us. Now I will tell you this, I did have a member with their icon pass 
that went over and spent the night and ended up buying a ticket to come back over the next day. And he was fine, but anything that you can do in advance to educate your people, that's our job. That is our job. Yes? So I'm a new trip leader. Yay! New trip leader. <laughs> One of my um, stressors and anxiety surrounds about, uh, when people get injured. Yes. And because I personally uh, had a trip of eight people and one person tore their ACL and I spent five hours in the ER with him and then drive into the airport seven hours away to get into the airport. So as a trip leader, what, you know, what, how do you handle something like this? Like what have people done when somebody on your trip is badly injured? Okay. Anyone in the crowd want to, want to answer how you handle situations with injuries? while you're on a trip? <laughs> David, how would you handle it? Number one, recommend they get the trip insurance ahead of time. Yes. Uh, number two, have their emergency release with you so you have a phone number and a name to contact so they have somebody to call to help with that. Um, and third, just be available to facilitate uh, communication. Correct. You know, there's that fine line of how much do we put our stuff out there and are we vulnerable to a situation that could go one way or the other. Be smart. Use good judgment. Personally, because I'm the mama bear, I will go and <coughs> take care of my people. And depending on what country you are in, what city you are in, how their um, medical community works, when I do my inspection, I'm always looking for where's the clinic, where's the hospital, where's the pharmacy. When I do, with the, when I meet with the tourist office, mm -hmm. I want to know where those places are. And I make sure my team knows that. And in cases that we are transferring by bus into our location, the resort, the hotel, and we pass the pharmacy, <laughs> I'll get the mic and say, the pharmacy's right here, you guys, and the clinic is over here. And if anything happens, I want you to contact me immediately. So I think just be prepared. Be prepared and communicate communicate well and do your very best. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is you want it to be successful and um, healthy. We had someone end up in the hospital. Uh, things do happen and they will happen. Be smart. Be smart. I'm in a position that I feel, and this is my personal opinion, but I want my entire team to be CPR, CPR certified. Mm -hmm. That's not part of our bylaws or our rules or anything. However, having had a recent situation that not knowing exactly what was going to take place, um, yes, I would be down on the ground and doing my best to revive my participants. There's a liability issue. Yes, there is. Debbie Stewart, personal, is willing to take that risk. Emilio. Um, our club does a lot of bus trips, and during the past 20 years, I guess, uh, we've had probably about three different instances where somebody got injured uh, on one particular trip, I was a trip leader, and I didn't even know I was informed. I mean, by the time I, I got the news, uh, one of our club members was transported by ambulance to a local hospital. And um, <coughs> fortunately, in all three cases, uh, the injury was relatively minor. They were able to stabilize the person, and our bus was able to drive by the hospital and pick them up on the way back. So we were lucky, but if, if it had been something more, 
serious, I'm not sure what I would have done. Well, that's when you need to really have a good working relationship with the tour operator, travel company that you are working with. I can tell you this, I sent my tour operator to the hospital to go see my participant in the hospital and took her luggage for me. Couple of things. When you are involved in a situation that is a little bit tricky, concerning, when you're dealing with it, bring one of your team members with you. I typically would choose one other than my husband, but if that was my only option, I would like to have a witness with me we have an incident injury form that we ask people to complete under any medical concern. Not just med hospitalization, but going to the clinic and you know, whatever. Um, definitely protect yourself, yet use good judgment. They're gonna happen, it is gonna happen. Um, I asked Gloria when we were in Zermatt to come with me because we had, to pick, we had to pack up my participants' belongings. We had to pack her suitcase. And her roommate, sweet as she was, she separated her belongings and her roommates and had it all out and ready for us basically this side of the room is hers so what i did is i went in and i took pictures on my phone of her belongings and then gloria was my witness and i packed up her suitcase and we sent it with sean to the hospital so again just you know use really good judgment and it's stressful when you're dealing with things that are out of the norm unusual but it does happen so yeah go ahead uh, i just wanted to add another thing about when you talked about credit cards yes um uh, i find personally i feel uneasy if i don't have some cash on hand mm -hmm. because not everybody takes credit cards. Correct. Uh, yes. And uh, there are situations where, you know, to buy just a cup of coffee, I feel better to just pay in right. cash. Also to leave a tip in the hotel room, you know. Right. Um, so I found that the best way to get cash when you're in a foreign country is to have a debit card linked directly to your checking account. And you just go to an ATM do a cash withdrawal and you get local currency and that gets automatically you know, taken out of your account. Now, I would not recommend anybody actually paying in a store with a debit card. Correct. But to go to a bank, to an ATM, just to withdraw some cash, that's the best way, I think. Correct. Armand, how do, how do we address that in our guidebook? I do state that <coughs> To, uh, I state what the country that we're going to, what the currency is, and that uh, if you want to go to the local ATMs to get money, you can. Uh, I, I don't say that uh, how to get all the money or what the process is. I just say look for these. They are, one of them is called AutoMap or AutoMarket. Mm -hmm. They have different names for the ATMs. And I, I do put that in the guidebook so they can know where to look for one. I do state that you'll find ATMs in uh, places where you take on the bus and the bus depots and the train stations, things like that. Yeah. But I don't address directly, uh, like what you're saying, using a debit card at an ATM. Possibly that's a good idea. I should put that in the guide. Mm -hmm. There's yes. no liquidity fees. Your your comp your you know your bank may charge you a major fee for taking out that money. Depends, right, depends on which bank and what card. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it varies. Mm -hmm. Laura? Well, I guess in just the traveling I've done, I found that banks are the safest place to go because I've actually been told by some of the guides or tour people that there are a number of ATMs, some are legitimate, some are not. Mm -hmm. And 
they all look the same. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's nice to be able to have some kind of resource that you can trust. Mm -hmm. um, that can tell you which ATM is a legitimate one and which was not. Right. When we're on our adventure trips and the extension portion of our ski trip, uh, we have a guide dedicated to us. And they're familiar with those local areas and those cities, and they will give us, you know, reach out to your resources. You know, definitely. Thank you. Okay. We'll be right back to you. Yeah. There was one more. Yeah, there? I just to make two comments. One on the uh, ATM. Yes. Um, when you use a, a debit card and an ATM, um, a lot of uh, a lot of them in, in foreign countries will give you the option of charging in the local currency or in dollars. Always charge in the uh, always charge in the local currency because your bank will give you a far better rate than mm -hmm. the ATM will. Um, and the same comment I was going to make is I don't know if you put it in your guidebook. The one thing I encourage people to do is take a copy of your passport. Oh, and put it in a bag, put it on your phone. So if that gets lost, yes. yes. it's much easier to yes. get a new one if you've got a copy yes. of the, the lost one. Correct. And we have those instructions that we communicate to our participants as well. Yep. Who's up? Yeah. Yes, Martin. Two, two things to add. In the first place, always have some local cash on you. I travel to Holland, my family's still in Holland. I travel to Holland on a regular basis. Many grocery stores, for instance, will use debit cards, but they don't use our debit cards. Uh -huh. So our debit card will work in an ATM, not at a grocery store. Right. Some grocery stores still don't take credit cards. Mm -hmm. So you sit with a whole cart full of groceries, and all of a sudden you can't use nothing. Right. So always have some cash on you. Yeah. The and second second thing about credit cards, make sure you have a credit card with a chip and a PIN number. Mm -hmm. Many, like for instance, train stations, if you buy a ticket, you have to use a credit card, but you have to have a PIN number. Um, and, and some banks so don't even know that. You go here to a bank, you know, mm -hmm. I went to my wife's credit union, and we want the PIN numbers. They say, no, that's only for ATM cards. No, that's also for credit cards. Uh -huh. So there's several things, you know, and that is for Holland. I don't know the rest of you. It's probably mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have a chip credit card, make sure you get a PIN number before you go. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you might get in trouble if you want to do something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, please. I just want to mention for insurance, just really look into the insurance. The one that I have looked into, I didn't do enough research. They wouldn't let you do the insurance until you paid in full. I broke my wrist before I paid in full. I had to pay for the full amount of my trip without any insurance. So be sure when you look into insurance that it doesn't say that you have to pay in full first before you can purchase the insurance. Any huh? time you're going anywhere, you can call your bank and just ask them if what the fees are associated with the, you know, pulling cash out of, you know, your bank. And also the credit card companies will tell you if they charge a fee or not. And I've had no problem as long as I check in advance. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say on like the on your medical forms, I would include food allergies. I recently learned I'm allergic to eggs, and that's a super tough one to navigate. Um, and uh, and then um, I was also going to say I, I was in the Ski Idaho annual meeting uh, a day before yesterday, and an insurance company that services a lot of our mountains were talking about how you're gonna see a lot more um, ability at, in ski areas in the US of adding uh, insurance to your daily lift ticket or when you buy your season pass. So that's a trend you'll see here in the US as well. One thing that I do regarding the medical information, on everyone's required to wear their neck wallet during all of Far West activities. On the back side of their name badge, we print contact information, allergies, medical. It's optional, but I'm here to tell you, when I have had to reach over and grab someone's back neck wallet and in a crisis situation and flip it over and look to see what I'm dealing with, praise the Lord that I had that information available to me. It's optional, but personally, I recommend it. 
And I'm willing to take the risk on that. That's been kind of a debated um, situation at our board level, but I'm willing to take the, the risk, and it has proven successfully. Chris, I wanted to ask you, do you have anything to contribute as a travel company? I'm not uh, Chris McCarthy with Overseas Adventure Travel, so non-ski related <coughs> adventures. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I know we've been talking a lot about the travel protection, mm -hmm. but uh, the one thing I, I didn't hear mentioned is um, uh, if you are purchasing travel protection through the tour operator, it's always good to know if it's a primary or a secondary coverage as well. Um, and uh, what a primary coverage will do is if you do need to submit a claim, you can submit it directly to the travel protection provider. If it's a secondary coverage, you need to submit a claim to your insurance first, and then it can go back to the travel protection. So it could be a couple uh, hoops to go through. Uh, and I'm not a insurance sales. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that you provide? So we, so we are a tour operator. No, 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 the insurance, because I think it's primary. Insurance. Yes, yes, so okay. we use a company called Allianz. Yeah, so right. that's so right. they, Yeah, and our travel protection also, is, it's, um, it's, it's based off of the sale price of the trip. So it's not age related as well. So yeah, really. that's, that's important. Right, and some companies, it's based on the price of the trip. It can also be price and age right. these days. So things are changing. Things are changing. Yeah, okay. How about you, Joan, Aphrodite? Do you have any comments? Yeah. You know, one thing, I'm, I'm Aphrodite with uh, Premier World Discovery. And First, I'd like to say I'm impressed with the operators you have here, OAT and Holidays and Mayflower, and we're happy to be part of that group. Um, one thing that I'd say that, that you mentioned, sometimes your operators, like a, a service that we provide uh, regarding your liability that you mentioned is mm -hmm. we can list our partners as additionally assured for you under our plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would just say check with your operators because some of us have the, the ability to really support you in those uh, in those unique ways. So that's that's one thing I want to do. Right, and that has been included in our RFP process. So do you guys understand what she's saying? Does it, does, do you know what she means by that? No, we don't. Okay, can you? So essentially, rather than you seeking uh, an individual liability plan for trips that you would do with us. For a specific can, trip. Exactly, mm -hmm. we can provide that. Well, we, we would cover you for an annual basis for any trips that you would do under our okay. umbrella, right? Okay. Um, so that's that's a, a service that some of your providers can, can provide for you that saves you a step and also gives you a little peace of mind, right? Um, right, and that makes me think of one other component. We do it as a service. And it saves you money. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. When, in my position with Far West, I am required to send out the request for proposals, the RFPs, to many of our travel companies, tour operators that we have a relationship with and or that we would like to have a relationship with. So I'm sending out many RFPs. When those bid proposals come back to me by the deadline, then what I do is what I call a comparison analysis. And I have a spreadsheet, and I have columns, and I'm checking out and, and populating that data based on each company's proposal. Right now, I'll be working on next year's East Africa <coughs> proposal. And that way, when I have it all listed, and I really get a good, thorough look-see, and that is also a, a added bonus to that comparison. Not everyone will do that. Um, I then present it to our travel executive committee. We discuss it. At that point, we make a decision as a committee, and I present it to the board of directors for a vote. So it is a, it's a calculated, it's a, it's a lot of work, but at that point, you know what you are offering. 
You know the ins and outs. You know which company is going to serve your participants the best based on. And sometimes we'll have phone call conversations or email communication back and forth and back and forth. You know, I'm, I'm negotiating a lot of those details for our members. But it's a great way to do that as opposed to saying, let's just do this one. Well, it's a big responsibility. You know? Any other questions? Mark? Yeah, I, I talked to some people who purchase annual trip insurance. Does anybody have any information on that, how they work, how successful they are? I don't have any experience with that. I'm aware of that being offered. Yes. I can't give you specifics. I, I, can, I can speak to that sure. a little bit. Mm -hmm. What we found with those annualized plans is there are a lot of exceptions. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my, my main point would be to, to really look into that. And okay, that was kind of my it's question. It's such a broad umbrella that they right. can't really uh, dig in as opposed to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, keep in mind, we yes. are a sports related industry mm -hmm. so there are a lot of exceptions to the rule Linda. um i i can't remember the name of the provider but in prior years i had um an annual policy and the last time i bought it it was a three-year policy but it is not trip cancellation insurance but it you know will get yourself and your travel companion home or your dead body home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's important, right? But it's not travel well, cancellation. Yeah. And, but it was good for the year, or in the case I got the three-year plan, and it was not just good. F it had a list of countries that it's valid for and some that were not included, but it was pretty inclusive. So when you're doing a lot of travel with different groups, um, that was a nice feature to have. And um, I was able to successfully use it a couple years ago when I got clobbered by a snowboarder in um, Jackson Hole, and I had to change my travel arrangements, and um, it did reimburse me, you know, so you had to follow their process, um, but I did get reimbursed for some of my costs. Mm -hmm. The last time I bought it, um, and it was the three-year plan, it also included um, helicopter evacuation from the mm -hmm. mountain if you should get sure. injured on the mountain. Yeah. And I just uh, I failed to yeah. renew yeah. it on the due date and I haven't gotten around to doing it again. But I think it, it was a good policy, but it is not trip cancellation insurance. And I can't stress enough to you, trip meetings, how important it is to work with a qualified travel company, tour operator, in the event of such situations, I may be calling Sean in New Jersey at 2 o'clock in the morning. He knows I'm out of town. He knows I'm in another country. I have his personal cell number. He picks up the phone. So, you know, I just cannot stress to you how important it is. We may think, oh, we can do that. We know how to run trips and stuff. But when you get into a tricky situation, you need to have that backup. And it definitely has proven to be well worth it. And thank you, Sean. <laughs> Many night lists. Oh, Sue, so, <laughs> I have a question about preferred group sizes. When you said you had 100 people, that seemed like a lot of people to me. Sure. And so two questions, preferred group sizes. And then if you have large groups, like 100 people, mm -hmm. do you divide them down and then your, your team, members of the team kind of take care of subgroups in that? How do you work that out? Okay. We knew that Zermatt is a top destination, top destination in the world. We do, in, with past experience, nine years ago, we had our highest number of people. We had two hotel properties, and I did divide my team where I had part of my team at one property and the rest were at the other property. Uh, next year, going to Madonna di Campiglio, I have budgeted a minimum of 67 people, thinking that is a great manageable number, all in one hotel, which is my preference. 
and my team will be there in that property with me. So it depends on your destination. Once again, rely on the professionals. These guys are the experts. They deal with many, many groups all year long. We're just dealing with our trip. What's your opinion? Get, you know, reach out to them and then go from there, base your budget accordingly. Mm -hmm. Add one other suggestion. I don't know how these apps work worldwide, but I read a lot of press tours for Ski Idaho, and I started, we've been working, or we're starting a partnership with Airflare, which is a great app, and mm -hmm. um, it's actually saved a life here in Idaho. And it's also saved a life in Colorado, where somebody was having a heart attack on the mountain, and the responders would not have been able to find them without that app. So it's it's tremendous. Um, it's no backup for a you know transceiver in in the backcountry, but I mean if you're off piste and stuff like that, I mean it's great to have. Another great app is um, Slopes. If you haven't been playing around with that, um, it not only tracks fun stats, but um, I was able to. We had several journalists on a mountain. We all got split up, and I could look on the app and see where people were. So we're at the top of a lift, and I see that some of them are halfway up the lift, so we just decided to wait for them. So, so, so uh, the Icon Pass app does that for you, too. Oh, wow. Just so you know. You can awesome. track yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. And Epic typically has the trackers, too. Oh. Yeah. When you're dealing in foreign countries, there's a neat little piece of equipment you can use now. It's about the size of a cell phone. It'll translate 140 different languages oh, if you've got internet service. Cell phones do that. A lot of them will yeah. translate six or eight without any internet or Wi-Fi service. Wow. wow. You speak in and it speaks out. They speak in and it speaks out. What's it called? It's a translate. It's called translate. Yeah. Do we have another question or comment over here? Well, as you guys can see, I tried to design this program so that it allowed us to have this interaction. And I really thank you for that. Yes, Amelia. I think it might be interesting to address the question of COVID. Uh, and I, I'd be interested to see how, what other people are thinking about it. But um, despite the fact that it's not an emergency anymore, and restrictions have been removed, etc. Uh, this, this past winter, in January, we had a trip to Canada by bus. I don't know, some 40 people in, inside a bus. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but it may be that just one of our people got COVID while in Canada. And during the trip back, he infected about, uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the participants got COVID. I would love to answer that question myself. <laughs> Having been a recipient receiver of COVID when we were in um, Germany, not this last year, not this year, the year before, we did our Solden, and we had one positive person that was in, we were all in one hotel, and she was rooming with one of my team members. And at that time, we were required to test prior to coming back to the United States. She was my only one that tested positive. So I addressed the fact that I would expect her to be quarantined, and I was going to move my team member out of her room who was reluctant to do that because she was there all week with her. However, the buck stops here. So I said, you will, we have another Far West room for you. We're going to move you. I don't want to move. I will move your belongings for you. <laughs> so she moved. I, in that situation, and it was my own teammate. I engaged Armand as my witness and said, I need to discuss this with you. I'm firm about it. How do you feel? He says, you're right, Deb. So then we handled it. No problem. We go on to our extension trip, and this was in the height of COVID. We go on to our extension trip. 
We had a great time, the Black Forest region, da da da, we got tested. I was positive, along with five other members. And we weren't allowed to go into the hotel that the rest of my group was overnighting to then leave the next day. So we found another hotel property for the six of us. We um, practiced and became very proficient with Zoom because we weren't to engage with each other. The hotel was wonderful. They brought us our breakfast every day, no problem. Going forward, this year, this was my role. On every bus, every train, and recommended on every airplane, you will wear a mask. And I did have some backlash with that. And this was my answer to that. Do you have a mask with you? Yes, I do. Put it on your face. Cover your nose and your mouth. Well, well, do you know the rules? Do you know? Yes, I do know the rules. Put it on your face. Well, whose rule is it anyways? Is it Debbie's rule? Yes, it is. Put it on your face. You have two choices. You will put your mask on, and the bus will go, or I will send you home. Do you let people know that? Oh, multiple times. <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> let me finish my story. I had one COVID case this trip out of 104 people. I consider that success. Yeah. And of course, people can, you're not tested now to get back to the States. You can be wearing a mask and have COVID. People on the plane could be positive sitting next to you. Wear your mask, protect yourself as well. I was very comfortable with that. My team reinforced that marvelously. Dave. Oh, no, I was just going to miss the facts. You know, it's been it's kind of the last, what, year and a half or so. Which, you know, the whole thing with COVID has kind of disappeared. It's, it's out there. I mean, it's well, sure. Probably, it's it's gonna be sure, it's going to be around. Or something exactly. Next week we'll get it. For my positive person, we, my team and myself, and I had this in writing multiple times, bring your N95 mask, your FFP2 mask, your, <laughs> oh, we had a whole list, okay. But with my one positive gal, we provided her a test kit. We all had our test kits. I encourage people to bring their test kits. I have test kits here with me today. I have masks with me as well. My one COVID person had an N95. If she didn't, we would give her one. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, yeah. So just, just be fine, five minutes. Okay, one more question and then I wanna read something to you guys. Okay. So these are some actual comments or complaints that have been received by a travel company, and I think it's um, quite interesting. This person wrote to the company and said, on my holiday to Goa in, in, in India, I was disgusted to find that almost every restaurant served curry. I don't like spicy food. <laughs> the roads were uneven and bumpy. So we could not read the local guidebook during the bus ride to the resort. <laughs> because of this, we were unaware of many things that we might have, our have had our holiday be more fun. And this is the classic one. My fiance and I requested two beds when we booked, but instead we were placed in a room with a king bed. <laughs> We now hold you responsible and want to be reimbursed for the fact that I became pregnant. <laughs> this, this would not have happened had you put us in a room 
with two beds. <laughs> be, be aware they walk among us and are reproducing. Thank you all very much.